I'm Anna Matani and I'm the assistant professor here um, in the department and I work on epistemology, logic and language and the philosophy of probability. So I think there's two different sorts of probabilities that people work on and one is objective probability which is like the real objective chances of things happening. So if you toss a coin and it's a fair coin, then the probability of it coming up heads is a half. And that's true even if nobody thinks that the probability is a half, that's just the objective chance. And if the coin is weighted towards heads, then the chance of it coming up heads is going to be more than a half. So I don't, I don't know if I even believe in objective probabilities, but the idea is supposed to be that you know they're out there independent of our evidence and of what we think about things. Um, and the sort of probability that I work on more is subjective probability. So you can think of these as degrees of belief. So they can vary from person to person and time to time. So if I toss the coin and you think that the coin is fair, then you might have a subjective probability, a degree of belief of a half that it will come up heads. Whereas if I know that the coin is weighted towards heads, my degree of belief that it will come up heads will be higher. Subjective probability I see is really an area within epistemology. It's to do with your epistemic state, what people believe. One of the things that I'm interested in is figuring out when someone's degrees of belief are coherent, like when, when they're consistent, when they're not contradictory. So when we're thinking about outright beliefs, it's, it's relatively easy, right? You, you've got incoherent outright beliefs if you believe contradictory things. But when you switch to thinking about degrees of belief, it's not so straightforward, because of course you can have degrees of belief in two contradictory claims. Um, so one way people have tried to resolve this is with Dutch book arguments. Say we're thinking about whether or not Paris is going to host the 2024 Olympics. And perhaps you've got quite a high degree of belief that it will, say it's 0.8. But you've also got a high degree of belief that it won't, say that that's 0.8 as well. So what happens is we imagine a bookie who comes along and offers you, offers you a book, like a set of bets. The first bet is you pay them £8 and you'll get £10 back if Paris does host the 2024 Olympics. And you'll accept that bet, right, because your degree of belief that it will is 0.8. And then they also offer you um, a bet whereby you pay £8 and you get £10 back if Paris doesn't host the 2024 Olympics. And you'll accept that as well because your degree of belief that it won't is 0.8. So now if you accept both of these bets, this book of bets, then you're guaranteed to lose money. We say that you've been Dutch booked and that's supposed to show that you're incoherent. There must be something wrong with your set of degrees of belief. There are these rules of probability, the probability axioms, and it turns out that if you violate any of them, if your degrees of belief don't match up to these rules, then you're vulnerable to a Dutch book. So the Dutch book arguments can be used to argue for the probability axioms, which is a really nice result. These Dutch book arguments are really great because they, um, they give us an argument for all of the probability axioms but they're problematic because they rule some agents to be incoherent or irrational that we don't think are irrational. Um, so for example, if you don't know what your own degrees of belief are, then you're vulnerable to a Dutch book argument. And if you don't have complete trust in yourself, like if you think that your degrees of belief could be mistaken, that you might have gone wrong somewhere, um, then again, you're vulnerable to a Dutch book argument. So you end up ruling that you're only rational if you have perfect self-knowledge and basically if you're really arrogant and you believe that um, you've got everything right. And intuitively, um, it can be rational, it can be epistemically virtuous to um, be cautious about your own epistemic state, right? To think that you might have got some things wrong. 
So this leads us to think that even though Dutch book arguments are so appealing because they give us this great result of they prove the probability axioms, there must be something wrong with them because we get these false results as well. So you might wonder why this matters, why we should care about whether people have coherent degrees of belief and why we should be trying to work out how to judge whether someone has a coherent set of degrees of belief. But, I mean, actually, I think it's really, really important. I mean, we're talking about consistency, really, here. And we definitely care whether people have a consistent, coherent epistemic state. I mean, if you think of uh, politicians, when politicians put forward the view and we spot an inconsistency in it, we think that they, we pull them up on it, right? We think that we need, they need to correct it. And we definitely don't want them to go ahead and act on the inconsistent beliefs. And I mean, I think this was really, it's really obvious when you're thinking about outright beliefs that you don't want to have contradictory beliefs. Because I mean, think about how you'd act. You'd, you'd, your actions would just become incoherent. And um, since philosophers have just become more sophisticated and started talking about degrees of belief, um, the problem's still there, right? We still want to be able to explain what it is to have a coherent set of degrees of belief because that's what's going to go on to inform people's actions.